All right, so we're continuing our Dangerous Prayers series, and I'm not sure how much longer this has. Um, I know we're going to start another one coming up on King David, which I'm super excited about. But Dangerous Prayers, I've actually had a conversation with someone one time, they're like, are our prayers dangerous? <laughs> and I think they were kind of taking it like it's dangerous to pray, but it's really, I take it as it's dangerous to the kingdom of darkness when we truly pray as the Lord wants us to. And we unleash that power of the Holy Spirit upon the world and in accordance with His will. That's dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. It's not dangerous to us. So I love this uh, dangerous prayer theme. But uh, I, I love billboards, bumper stickers, and about 15 years ago, I saw one that truly resonated with me. And let me, let me see how you, uh, if this resonates with you. Just the phrase at the top, I actually had to recreate this. I couldn't find the one I saw 15 years ago, but it was here in town, and it, I think it was for the Marion School of Nursing. But this one, so I, this is a billboard, a real one, but I put the phrase at the top that I saw about 15 years ago, and it said, life is short, I want to make a difference. And that just does something to me inside. That, that says a lot about what I want my life to be, and I think it, it does for most, if not all of us, right? We want to make sure that our time here on the planet counts for something, don't you? <laughs> Whether it's just one person. One person for the kingdom of Christ, then it's all worth it. So when I saw that, and about 15 years ago, Kira and I were actually starting our, our first church. We were uh, the lead planters of a new church plant out in Brownsburg. And you talk about being nervous. You know, I'm a little nervous right now. Hopefully I'll shake the rust off. But, you know, here we are. We're, we were living on the south side. We were like, we're going to move out to Brownsburg. We feel like the Lord's leading and Lord, we we're all about our, what's our mission statement, vision from you, Lord, purpose. What are we going to do? What is it you want us to do? And when I saw this, I was like, I don't know all that yet, but all I know is life is short and I do want to make a difference. And so how can we live a guaranteed life that makes a difference for the kingdom of God? Because I don't want to just make a, a difference from an earthly perspective, I don't know about you, I think what is really the most, what we should be shooting for is, I want to make a difference for the kingdom of God, for the kingdom of Christ, for the King of kings and Lord of lords. So that's what I want to talk about this morning, is how can we, this is a pretty strong word, I'm saying, a guaranteed life of making an impact for the kingdom of God. I know I took a risk in putting that guarantee in there, but I think I'm backed up by the Word of God. So let's take a look at, and here's how we do it. I think one of the keys is, is praying and doing what is on God's heart and God's mind. His heart, His mind. So if we are focused and we are in alignment with His heart and His mind, what percent of the prayers do you think the Lord will answer if we are in alignment with what's on his heart and on his mind? <laughs> Somebody said 100, yes. I think that's true. I believe it is. If we are, another way of saying this is, I'm praying in accordance with the will of God. I believe Jesus or the Father or the Holy Spirit, they want to answer that prayer 100% of the time. So, if we can discern what is on his heart and on his mind, and then we pray that. Uh, one author I'm reading, or I have read a book by Graham Cook, he calls it Crafted Prayer, and I highly recommend that. But he, he makes that same point. You can craft a prayer that you know is the Lord's will when he's already spoken to you about this is on my heart and on my mind, this is my will and then you just pray that back to him, you can have confidence that that crafted prayer is going to accomplish his heart, his mind, his will. So that's what I encourage us all to do, young or old. And that is the best way to pray, and it will be a dangerous prayer to the kingdom of darkness. So the, the key verse here 
of his heart and his mind is 1 Samuel 2.35. I'm going to come back to this, but I want to explain a little bit right now. As I mentioned, about 15 years ago, we were planning our first church. Um, you know, much younger, much, <laughs> much less gray and wrinkles then. But really, like, Lord, how are we going to do this? And I said that billboard re- resonated with me. Well, this is a scripture that I'm so thankful for, and it means as much to me now as it did then. Because when I read this, and I was studying the book of 1 Samuel, I just knew this was a personal word to me, but I know it's a personal word to you as well. So, 1 Samuel 2.35 says, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind, and I will firmly establish his priestly house and they will minister before my anointed one always. Uh, I think every time I get to speak here, I say, that's my favorite verse. Well, this is top five. This is an amazing verse. And I know it says the word, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest. And so you're not off the hook. (laughs) I'm not off the hook. I was a pastor, but it was speaking to me. In the New Testament, we have the concept of priesthood of all believers. I think we can thank uh, Martin Luther for drawing that out. But it talks about us being a royal priesthood and that God is making a home, or in 1 Peter you'll see that he's making a structure out of his people who are priests. And really, a priest, and this is not to lower the, the office of a priest, say a Catholic priest or an Orthodox priest or someone that has that office. We are truly priests and a priest is someone that helps people in their relationship with God who intercedes for them in prayer in the Old Testament who offered sacrifices for them and for atonement help them reconnect with the Lord get that sense of forgiveness and really that's what we're called to do for one another we're a kingdom of priests so in the New Testament so what kind of priest do we want to be or pastor, or mom, or dad, or friend. Because I think you could replace even that word with priest, and it still has this amazing meaning that I'll be a pastor, a friend, a faithful servant of the Lord who will do according to what is in the Lord's hand, my heart and in my mind. And I, tend, I really have focused on that first part. I call that part A. But really, part B is so cool too. I will firm, look what the Lord will do if we minister and we do it according to what's on his heart and in his mind. It says he will firmly establish our priestly house. And then we will get to minister before his anointing would always. That's pretty cool. I think that's ministering before Christ always. And we'll just hand it down to our family. So, This has been a a truly guiding, so the question is going to be, how do we (laughs) pray what's in his heart and his mind? How do we hear that? How do we know that? And we're going to talk more about that here in just a minute. But I need a drink. So let's go on and provide some context to 1 Samuel. Um, So some of, I'm not going to go real deep on this. I think this is where Kira said, don't go too deep. (laughs) You only have so much time, Um, because she knows I'd like to, and then you guys be asleep. But it's always good to have some background on the book of 1 Samuel, and I think this is a a pretty good summary. The the book of 1 Samuel, it's about 1100 uh, B.C., so it's uh, probably at least a thousand years post-Moses and the Exodus, so the Israelites are in the promised land but they have been faithful and unfaithful, faithful, unfaithful, chased after foreign gods. They've had different judges rise up. You've heard of names like Deborah and Samson and those. That's, that's all past. And now um, it, they've been given the tabernacle, and that's where people would come to offer sacrifices and worship. This is before the temple was built. But the tabernacle was in Shiloh. And there's this woman named Hannah. And 
she was in anguish, but she was at the tabernacle worshiping, and she would do that faithfully and come and offer sacrifices. She was in anguish because of infertility, and she had a rival. Uh, her husband, uh, El- Elkanah, I could probably say he was not one of the smartest men in the world because he said something like this to his wife who was battling infertility, crying, weeping, and he said, um, Hannah, aren't I worth more than ten sons? So I think that was one of the dumbest things ever said <laughs> in the Bible. I, I, I think, yeah, he was not thinking too bright. But he tried to then butter up and give her bigger pieces of sacrifice and things like that. So he did love her deeply. But Hannah was in anguish about not being able to have a child. And she was at the tabernacle praying fervently. And she said, oh Lord, if you'll give me a son, then I, will, I vow that I will give him to you all the days of his life, and he'll serve you forever. And she's saying she would bring him to the tabernacle and basically let him grow up there under the high priest Eli. So, and she fulfilled that vow. After she weaned the child, I don't know exactly what age, probably three, four, five, she brought him to the tabernacle and fulfilled that vow. And I think that was a pretty, pretty big risk. Eli was old. <laughs> I mean, uh, we're going to see he passes away at like 98, so he was probably 90s. And he already had two wicked sons, which I'm going to talk a lot about here in a minute. So I think it's kind of a risk, taking your toddler to the tabernacle under this much older high priest, and you know his two sons aren't good, good guys. We'll talk about that in a minute. Again, we've already mentioned God's perspective, his heart, his mind. That's a theme throughout. We're going to start that series on King David, and David is known as a man after God's own heart. Yes. And that starts here later on in 1 Samuel. So we're also going to see Samuel's call and his response, and then he does have kingdom impact. Amazing. And then 1 Samuel really talks about King Saul, not Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, but King Saul, the first king of Israel, it's described in 1 Samuel. And then King David, when he rises up, the beginning of his kingship. So, let's get back to, this is going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 2, and we're going to look at some verses here. I mentioned Eli's wicked sons. We're going to do some compare and contrast of living and doing what's on God's mind and heart versus not. And first we'll look at the, the bad side with Eli's wicked sons. In 1 Samuel 2.12 it says, Now Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. I wrote in my Bible next to that, uh-oh. <laughs> so if that's the description of you from God, the summary of your life, you're in trouble. And especially if you are the son of the high priest, sons of the high priest, and he's so old, you're the ones in charge of the tabernacle. Uh Uh-oh, you're in trouble. If God's summary is these two, Hophni and Phinehas, if you're described as having no regard for the Lord and a wicked man, you're in trouble. Um, Here's some other, in 1 Samuel 2.17, It says, the sin of the young men was very great, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. And I'm summarizing some things. I'm not, there's a whole description of what used to be tradition. So people would come to the tabernacle and bring a bull, a lamb, a goat, and they would offer a sacrifice. And they're coming to worship and get reconnected with the Lord or deepen their worship. And priests are supposed to facilitate that. Priests are supposed to help them draw near to the Lord. God said, my house is to be a house of prayer. It was supposed to be an atmosphere of prayer and worship and drawing close to God Almighty. But here you have Eli's wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas, running the show. And so they were supposed to, when people would, they'd slaughter an animal and then on the, in the tabernacle, on the altar, they would throw some of the blood. They would then burn up the fat and boil the the offering the animal and it was a pleasing aroma to the lord then tradition became i don't know how big this fork was but with a big fork 
the priest or his servant would then, once it's cooked, stab that meat. And if you're like me on Thanksgiving, you hope it gets a big chunk, <laughs> right? But, but they would stick it in there, and then whatever they pulled up on that big fork would be the priest's portion and legitimately take that. Okay, make sense? Well, Eli's wicked sons, what they did, they said, hey, give us raw meat. They were like, whoa, no, no, people coming. No, they even knew it was wrong. Let's wait, let's boil it, let the fat be burned up, and then you can take what you want. No, Hophni and Phinehas, they'll only take raw meat, and if you don't give it to us, we'll take it by force. So how would you like to come to church this morning? And I say, open your wallet. <laughs> well, let me give uh, later on. No, give it to me now, or I'll take it by force. Do you think I would have the Lord's favor upon me? How likely are you to come back? What's that going to do to your prayer time? See, these guys, I don't know how they got to this point in their life, but, but the, the problem is, and we see it all around us, even in our own family, which is tragic and heartbreaking, is you can be so close to the things of God and still miss it if you're on your own agenda. Ah, that's so sad. We've experienced it in our own family. I experienced it the first 20-some years of my own life. I was all on my own agenda. Thankfully, the Lord's patient. And I do. There is grace, right? Now, God's going to judge these guys, and they deserve it. <laughs> and He's given them a chance. Excuse me. He's given them a chance to repent and turn and, and get right. And I, I'm, I also want to give a, a um, defense. I always hear, well, God in the Old Testament is a God of wrath, but the God in the New Testament is a God of mercy. And I refute that. It's the same God, same heart. He is full of mercy from beginning to end. There are judgments that he makes, but he is always full of grace and mercy when we just turn to him and say, Lord, please forgive me. Will you forgive me? I want to turn to you. I know I've been going the wrong way. So let's not lose sight of that when we see what's going to happen to these, uh, these characters. So it contrasts there in 1 Samuel 2.18. We just talked a little bit about Eli and his wicked sons. And it starts mentioning Samuel, the young boy. He's at the, the tabernacle ministering before the Lord. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Isn't that cool? And it says in other scriptures, his mother Hannah would make that for him every year. So it's basically a priest's garments, very ornate. But she dressed him like a little priest, as like a little guy. And then as he got older, she would even update it. So here this guy, I wonder what Hophni and Phinehas thought about when they'd see this little dude running around, ministering before the Lord. Who knows what he was doing, you know? getting wood for the sacrifice, helping out, cleaning stuff, while those guys were doing what they were doing. So, as we look at this next verse, 1 Samuel 2.25, there is a time when Eli, even though he's in his 90s, he did go to them and tried to rebuke them. And he said, his sons, however did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. Now that's pretty harsh, right? But there's another part, not just taking the sacrifice, and I, I thought I had this slide in here, but it, I, I may not. Another thing they were doing, it says they were actually sleeping with the women who were working at the entrance to the tabernacle. Hophni and Phinehas. So both of them. That was their practice. Somehow, I don't know exactly what these ladies, young ladies, or just ladies, it says, the women that work at the tabernacle, at the entrance. So instead of, again, fostering worship, they're making a mockery of it. Again, God said, these guys are wicked, they're evil. They were all about their own agenda, their own consumption. So this is why they didn't respond to Eli's rebuke. And then the Lord's also holding Eli accountable for this too. 
even though he's an older man. He rebuked them. They didn't listen. They kept doing it. He still had the power to remove them from service. All he would have had to do, he had all the power and authority. He could have had them shut down, removed. He didn't. And God held Eli accountable as well. So, in this, this next verse, now we're going to look at Samuel and begin to see what it looks like to pray and then do what is on the Lord's mind and his heart. So here's this young guy. And the Lord came and stood there calling, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And then Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And I left out the parts where God actually did this three times total. And he's a little boy, and the first time he hears the Lord, he didn't really know the Lord's voice yet, and he ran into the priest Eli, and Eli said, I didn't call you, and then he came back and he said, I didn't call you. And then the third time he said, well, go lay down, and if he says, Samuel, just say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And this is one key I really want to highlight today to being able to discern what is on the Lord's in his heart and in his mind. And um, it starts with listening. (laughs) I know that's not always the way I pray. Like it's usually, I'm speaking, Lord. (laughs) I'm speaking, and I'm speaking more, and I'm telling you what I want. Here's what's on my heart and on my mind. This situation's horrible. Will you change it? Lord, I need this job. Will you change that too? Lord, this family member needs your help. Will you please help them? Lord, I have this ache and pain. Will you help that? Without even asking. Lord, what's on your heart and your mind? So I'm really trying to put that 1 Samuel 2.35 and 1 Samuel 3.10 together. That's what I really want us all to, to get a takeaway from today. Is speak, Lord for your servant is listening. And then you can even say, Lord, what's on your heart? What's on your mind? I think that's a very powerful combination. I've actually practiced it for 15 years. I would say off and on, not perfect. But when I do, I hear him much more clearly. Um, I've also been ministering long enough. I ask this question a lot in life groups or one-on-one. And... I'm always surprised. I'll say, hey, have you ever felt the presence of the Holy Spirit? And I, I, a lot of times I'll get, no, I've, I've actually never have felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, man, we've got to get you to tap into that. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit, here's where we even have an advantage over Samuel. And we're going to study the life of King David. These are Old Testament saints that prior to the Holy Spirit being given, now the Holy Spirit came upon them, but the Holy Spirit didn't reside in them. And here we are after Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection, and He has given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And other Scripture tells us that, look at us, as believers in Christ, we are, Christ lives in us. Wow, that's an advantage over Samuel or David. The Holy Spirit lives within us. And 1 Corinthians 2 9, or yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it it talks about the Holy Spirit is within us, and we actually have the mind of Christ. So I think we have the technology. (laughs) We have what I, I love this new term of spiritual intelligence we can cultivate because the Holy Spirit's within us, and we can feel his presence we can hear him i think it starts with not praying my agenda or your agenda but praying lord speak i'm listening and we can even start to skew it though if we say lord speak can you tell me about this situation can you tell me about that's fine but we really need to spend some time in silence and just saying lord speak for your servant is here listening. That's my encouragement, my challenge to you is if 
And if that's part of your practice, awesome. Keep doing it and even cultivate it more and more. I encourage you at least in the morning when you first wake up, instead of grabbing this <laughs> or it goes off, set it to the side and say, speak, Lord. Your servant's listening. What's on your mind? What's on your heart? And then just listen. And then it's okay if you say, hey, you know what's on my mind and heart, Lord. Can we talk about that? That's fine. But be building that relationship with him. So I, that's just really what I'm passionate about. I know that it can enrich your prayer life. And it'll be dangerous prayers because you will then be in alignment with what's on the Lord's mind and heart, praying his will, doing his will. So let's look at some highlights from Samuel's life of praying because Samuel was faithful to the end. I love when we see examples in Scripture of people that start strong, finish strong. And Samuel is one of those. Little boy, he got to do some amazing things. And I attribute it to him doing what's on the Lord's heart and mind. So he got to anoint Saul as the first king of Israel. Then he got to confront Saul. Because <laughs> Saul was a lot like Eli's wicked son. Saul was all about himself. Saul started strong, but Saul got off. He didn't. I don't think he really nurtured that relationship with the Lord. Unlike David, who's going to replace him. David messed up. But God still described him as a man of my own heart. David was quick to repent. Forgive me, Lord. Saul wasn't. Saul was like, can we just cover this up? Make me look good? Oh, ignore that monument I made to myself. He did at one point, too. So, he got to anoint David as king. And these are all when he had conversations with the Lord. And again, this is a man walking without the Holy Spirit inside him, which we have. He got to serve as a faithful priest, judge, and ruler. And again, he walked with integrity. There was no condemnation. He finished strong. And he made eternal kingdom impact. That's Samuel. So, here's what I'm really trying to share today. The Lord is looking for men and women, young and old, who will make an eternal kingdom impact and by praying what's in his heart and his mind. Um, this fits with, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we've talked about David, a man after my own heart. Remember Jesus even said, I didn't come to do my will, I came to do the Father's will. And I thought of another one like Jesus. <laughs> Sometimes... You're like, yeah, John, 100% of my prayers get answered. Well, I feel like, God, you know, there may be promises in Scripture if you're like me where you say, hey, I, I'm, I'm claiming one right now where I feel like the Lord gave us in regard to our son, I will restore the years the locusts have eaten. That is a cry of our heart. And I'll say, hey, Lord, this looks like it's your will. When are you going to restore all this? Because there's a lot of pain right here. And then Isaiah where he'll say, oh, look, I'm doing a new work. <laughs> Do you not perceive it? I'm like, where's that new work? So I think it's on your mind and heart to restore that. Why? What's taking so long? That's where things get difficult, right? When you have to wait. And we have some other great examples where you can get to where, Lord, I don't understand everything, but I trust your, your will. I trust your heart. The Apostle Paul had the thorn in the flesh. He prayed multiple times, Lord, take it away, take it away, take it away. And the Lord, the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. So he heard the will of God there. Somehow he knew the Lord wanted to walk with that. Jesus prayed, Lord, please take this cup from me when he faced the cross. But after praying, he knew that it was still the Lord's will. Sometimes it's, it's not what we want, but we... But look at their reaction. They were so connected and so close. That's where, if we're cultivating that, Lord, I'm just all about what's on your heart and your mind, and you can go through anything in this life. So, just to summarize, so I want you to walk away with this. I'm trying to make a case for 1 Samuel 2.35 being one of the most awesome verses in the Bible. <laughs> 
So you should memorize it, at least part A. I will rise up for myself, raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. And it's curious the word, instead of on my heart and mind, he wants us to not just do what's on his heart and mind, he wants us to do what's in his heart and in his mind. And if we can get so close to him and understand that, it's going to change our prayers. And then the part here from 1 Samuel 3, 1, where just that simply, like little boy Samuel, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I think you can combine those two. Lord, speak, Lord, I'm listening. What's on in your heart and in your mind?